Good morning, everybody. Delighted you guys all found your way around to the uh, the new entrance, the new entrance for today, which is not easy, given that it's hard to find the, your way into this building anyway. Uh, but I'm glad you're here, and I'm uh, happy to hope you had a nice weekend. And I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today, Brian Wansink, Dr. Brian Wansink. Um, you're just about to hear the, one of the most engaging speakers I think you ever will. Um, and, but, but he couples the engaging style with an incredible amount of scientific rigor in the work he does. Um, Brian received his PhD in marketing from Stanford University and then really hit the ground running in terms of a career. And he's taught at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. He's taught at Dartmouth. Um, he's taught at the University of Illinois um, and at Cornell and now and then um, then there's a place I missed, didn't I? There was one other place. That's oh, a Dutch university. Oh, yeah. He, <coughs> he's been a visiting professor in the Netherlands and in France. So he's, he's, he's been invited around the world to do very impressive things. Um, and you're about to see some very impressive work that explains exactly why he's such a prominent figure in the field. Um, he is one of the pioneers in investigating how the environment and, and what might seem small manipulations in the environment have a big impact on eating. Uh, his work is, has been featured in a number of television shows. Uh, he's very often uh, called as an expert to uh, various conferences and to the government to, to work on various public policy issues. And has written a book that you see up there called Mindless Eating. Um, I highly recommend the book. It's very interesting because it brings together the work that he'll talk about today but puts it in a very interesting context about what people can do about their eating and also um, has some suggestions about how the research that he's done in the laboratory might be able to be used in a public policy setting. So he's a person who's had a tremendous amount of influence. Uh, at Cornell University, he runs a large laboratory with an, a number of students working with him and has published an impressive series of papers on issues related to environmental determinants of eating. Um, then, um, what, a year and a half or so yeah. ago, uh, he was appointed by the White House to a position at the U.S. Department of Agriculture as Executive Director of the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. Uh, it's, it's an important part of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and you can see from the name, deals a lot with, with policies related to nutrition and has major impact on what's happening in the country. So here's a rare person who has done the academic work in such an impressive way, but has taken it into the public policy arena more recently. So let's please welcome today Dr. Brian Wansink. That was wonderful. I really appreciate that, that introduction. And I really appreciate being here, too. Let me give you a little idea what we're going to talk about today. And it's <clears throat> how we move from mindless eating to healthier eating. Now, you can see what's going on is that I've had a, I, I kind of have two hats. One, I'm a professor at Cornell. But I'm on leave of, a leave of absence for about two years, which ends January 20th when the new president comes in. And I'll be going back there um, January 21st. So how many people have seen this before? Yeah. How many people say, I have lived in a mayonnaise jar all my life and I've never seen this? Yeah, OK, OK. The <laughs> mayonnaise dwellers, OK. Well, you see this how as time's going on, there's new colors we add to a map to kind of be able to, to accommodate an increased percentage of people with BMI over 25, okay? But what I've done, you know, you see this, you can't go, yeah, okay, there's more colors, and I actually like colors, so I don't see any problem with it. <laughs> but I want to, to put this in perspective, I want to give you an idea of what I think is going to happen if this trend continues. This is what I think we might see in the year 2025 if projections continue. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, you from New York, you're safe. Um, from, from Huntington Beach over there, you're safe too. But I think the rest of us have to worry. And I put that up there because the stuff I'm seeing today does not reflect the U.S. government. Okay? In fact, I had to take a vacation day to come here. So I need to tell you that what I'm talking about today is not U.S. Department of Agriculture talk. It's Brian talk. Okay? So, a number of years ago, 1984, I had this incredible road to Damascus conversion. And, and what it was was, up until that point, I thought I was doing research. I thought I was coming up with some OK insights. But what I quickly became aware of is that nobody else was aware of these insights. And then if, if there was miraculously somebody who did know about it, it certainly didn't 
get them to make the decision to change the way they eat or how much they eat. And if even they made the decision at time t, at time t plus 1, it didn't have really any impact on action. What it really made me think about is, how do I want to rearrange my research? How do I want to rearrange the way that it gets communicated so that it actually can have an impact? Well, the reason I talk about this is because at the end of the talk, we'll come back around to something that we're working on, something we call it the small plate movement, which is an example of one of the things we're trying to move out there and to make, uh, put some points on the board with respect to this research. So here's what we'll do. <coughs> the structure is, I'll start with an overview of some of the ways that we've sort of addressed this idea of, of, of overeating at home. I'll show five myths that pretty much mess up the way a lot of us eat, OK? And there are five myths that are really intelligence traps, meaning the more intelligent a person is, the more likely they're liable, li liable to fall victim to these myths. Now, these are from a couple chapters, chapters two and three, basically, from the book Mindless Eating. And then what I want to finish with is some insights related to the small plate movement, one of the things we're trying to do to get this to the next level. So <clears throat> there's all sorts of labs you're probably familiar with. Now, most of you who I, uh, not most of you, but the, uh, the few I've been able to talk with um, are in the social sciences, and you're used to social science labs. But in almost all of the research we do, all of our colleagues end up being in nutrition labs or something like this, where they have like bubbling beakers and like professors with crazy hair and stuff like that. But the kind of labs in the social sciences that look at issues like obesity end up looking more like, like this, OK? Um, our lab is really at, uh, it looks exactly like uh, the way your home might look. If your home had one-way mirrors in it, and if your home had like <laughs> hidden cameras, <laughs> and if your home had like scales underneath surfaces, OK? <laughs> I'll give you an idea. Because one of the things that we do is probably about 60% of our research is sort of psychology related, where we go in there and we, we change something. Like we'll bring people in and we'll change the topic that they're talking about, whether it's a stressful topic or a fun topic or a boring topic. We'll see how much they eat at lunchtime. We'll go in there and we'll alter the music or we'll, we'll, take, or we'll alter the TV show that they're watching, see how that might mess up what happens. Okay? And what we're always looking at is how does something like from the environment, whether it be what you're person's doing across the table from you, whether it be the lighting, whether it be the color of the plate, how that influences unknowingly how much you eat. Now, it's a little bit hard to picture this. So let me give you an idea of, of, um, of a study so you can better picture this, because this will be sort of a benchmark you can use as we go through the talk. Sure, concentrating while I'm 
shoveling it in. Well, most people believe that we know when we're full. Well, we don't really know when we're full. So you small plate? Oh, absolutely. Because these are mindless ways. Well, no, what did we discover this well back? I, I happen to. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, the beginning of what a stroke looks like, apparently. <laughs> so when we discovered this, one of the things that I did was a short, a short time after that, I had to be given a talk down at the Institute of Medicine on another topic. Okay. But I was so excited about this finding that just parenthetically at the end of the talk, I said, oh, yeah, 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 and da-da-da-da-da-da. The Institute of Medicine is kind of an interesting place. Um, and people are there are really, really smart. But for some unknown reason, every person there has a British accent. Okay. <laughs> now they could be from Omaha, but it'd be, you know, the British Omaha accent, you know. And this guy says to me, he says, Well, surely, and this is myth number one, surely something as basic as the size of a bowl wouldn't influence how much an informed, intelligent person eats. Oh. I guess that's kind of reasonable. But let's see. <laughs> so what I did was I was teaching a, a course at that time. And these are really, really smart graduate students. So they were, in, were intelligent. And I took one class session. I probably shouldn't have done this. I took one class session. For 90 minutes, I did nothing more than to tell them that if I gave them a gallon-sized bowl of Chex Mix, they would take and eat more than if I presented them with two half-gallon bowls. Pretty complicated concept there, isn't it? Yeah, we can just imagine how pe happy people were to hear about this for 90 minutes. So I lectured, we showed videos, I had people come up and do demonstrations, I broke people into groups so they could discuss how they could prevent this from ever happening to them. Um, we did interpretive dancing. <laughs> and then what happened is they left, being very intelligent and also very informed. Now what happened is that about six weeks after that, when they came back from a uh, uh, holiday break, they got this seemingly unrelated invitation from me that said, hey, hey, uh, want to come to a Super Bowl party? It was that we, held it, we held it at a place called Jillian, sort of a sports bar. Anybody familiar with? Yeah, it's a, I think they have like 19 of them around the country. About half these people said yes, or about two-thirds of them said yes. They showed up at the sports bar, and when they showed up, um, they were led to one of two rooms to pick up their snacks before they went on to watch the game. Guess what the snacks were? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the people went in the left, the room on the left, ended up being presented with gallon sized bowls of Chex Mix. You know, they took over as much as they wanted on a plate. When they got to the end of the counter, or in, to the end of the table, Somebody gave him a questionnaire that, you know, is, is a meaningless questionnaire that had them write down who you think is going to win the game or something. We didn't even really care. But it, what it necessitated is that they put their plate down. And when they put their plate down, the only place where they could put it was this corner of the table that happened to have a scale underneath it, a tablecloth. <laughs> they set it down, and it shows exactly how much they took. In the parallel room, which was exactly like it in every way, the same thing was going on except it had twice as many half-gallon sized bowls of Chex Mix. Same total volume, but the smaller bowls, which suggest a smaller consumption norm and obediently lead people to take less. Now, the crazy thing was, people who were serving themselves from these big gallon sized bowls took and ate about 53% more. Okay? But after the Super Bowl was over and they were leaving the, 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 the Jillians, we'd intercept them and we'd say, Hey, you know, on average, the people uh, uh, coming, the people in your group took 50% more popcorn than people over here. Do you think the size of the bowl had anything to do with it? And, and what do you think people would say? No! Oh, God, no, how could it? I'm way too smart to be fooled by a bowl. <laughs> And we say, well, well, why do you think that on average uh, your group ate 50% more than the other group? And people go, ah, uh, yeah, you know, I didn't have breakfast yesterday. I, yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah. And that's the problem with these is these cues are ubiquitous. I mean, this is just one cue we're talking about here, but they are all around us. And anything that leads us to unknowingly eat too much 
does so not only ubiquitously, but it does so because we believe we're too smart to be fooled by something like this. Now, <coughs> you kind of wonder, where does, where does this end? And one of the things <coughs> we end up doing is saying, how far could we stretch this? And I'll give you an idea. If you end up asking people to think of the last time they overate, let's think of the last time you overate. You know, I mean, you over to the point where you're like this, almost regretful. I mean, it could have been like last night. I don't <laughs> Okay, if I were to ask you on that occasion, why did you eat so much? Think of what the answer is. What would be an answer one of you would boldly share? The last time you overate, sir? Because the food tasted so good. Yeah, yeah, in fact, that is the biggest answer. They say, because the food was really, really good. And the second answer is? Because I knew I'd be hungry. Yeah, because I was really, really hungry. <laughs> Now, about 11% of the people will say something like, well, I was, I was feeling down or I was, you know, I was feeling a little bit uh, uh, melancholy and I ate because of that reason. But um, it, it ends up being um, almost 88% can be explained by one of those two things. Well, so we decide to see what happens if you get somebody who isn't hungry and you give them food that isn't any good. <laughs> will they still be fooled by something like this? And so we did a um, study here, and this is just outside of... Uh, of Chicago, Illinois. Anybody from uh, Illinois, Chicago area? Now, this is Mount Prospect, western suburb. People came to a theater there. And what we did was we gave them popcorn and either, um, uh, you know, those, those buckets that are, you know, those kind of big buckets. They're about, you know, $7.50 each. You know. <laughs> or we gave them those really, really huge Holy Roman Empire-sized buckets that like 710. <laughs> and they look like this. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things we did, though, is they were, people were given, some people, half the people were given good popcorn, but the other half of the people were given terrible five day old popcorn. Okay? I had, I had a good friend at the time who was an entomologist. And you know what entomology means? Yeah. Well, she had a lab that, had, uh, that was humidity controlled, so we kept it for five days in the sterile lab with about 65% humidity. And nasty, this is like styrofoam. And what happened, though, is when people showed up, we intercepted, we took people who had just eaten, finished eating within 15 minutes before coming to, to the movie theater. When they showed up, we gave them one of these buckets. Now, you could probably guess what the punchline is going to be here. Even though they weren't hungry, even though the food was terrible, they ended up eating. You can see the brown is the, is the old popcorn, the uh, yellow is the fresh popcorn. Even though they hated the popcorn, they still ended up eating this is about 30, 35% more popcorn simply because the cue of the size of the bucket. But again, what do you suppose they say when they leave the, when they leave the movie theater and you say, hey, hey. What do you think of the popcorn? They go, oh, it's just terrible. And you go, why on average did you eat a third more than somebody with a smaller bucket? Do you think the bucket had anything to do with it? What, what do they say? <laughs> no, couldn't have. Oh, was it because you're really, really hungry? No, I just eaten before I got here. And that's the problem with these cues. Okay. Now, I want to show you something. You kind of say, well, where does this kind of begin? And we'll take a look at this, this hoggish little girl here. <laughs> no, I, I learned a long time ago that if you're ever going to put a photo up that's embarrassing, it better either be of you or your daughters. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> we take a look at this. I'll show you just a little bit of study. Where what we, what we want to do is look at four-year-old kids and see how the size of a, of a cereal bowl influenced how much they took and ate. Okay, now here we go. Right. So did you uh, play in the snow this morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> you know how much uh, cereal you would like? Other cereal. Would that be okay? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you like more? More. And even with the second scoop, it might be good to pour out half. Brian Wansink and Colin Kane are food psychologists <laughs> at Cornell University. 
interested in what, why, and how people eat. They are devising an experiment to study the eating patterns and psychological systems at work in the minds of preschool children. Is this enough? More. <laughs> Is that enough, or would you like more? No. That's enough? Okay. What are you trying to do see whether what happened at home influences them as healthy or unhealthy eaters today, or is that enough? Why did it I'll show you just a little idea. This is just a little preliminary view of a little bit of the, a pilot part of that data. But here's what happens. If we rank order these little kids, and these are four-year-old kids, if we rank order them by BMI, by BMI percentile, and you can see the dotted line is how much they request and eat if, you give them, if they're given a, um, a larger bowl. And I think these are 24-ounce bowls and 12-ounce bowls, if I believe correctly. And you'll see that it doesn't matter how, what the BMI of a child is. Every single one of these kids, except for one, ended up requesting and eating more cereal if they were given a big bowl than if they had been given a smaller bowl that still wasn't constraining it at all. So this ends up having an impact that goes way beyond us going to the movie theater and watching James Bond last night and finishing that. No, I didn't finish it. OK, let's take a look at something else. Because these cues are, are everywhere around us. And the thing with glasses, I, I had, uh, when I kind of had found this, I was giving a talk at, um, I think it's one of the American Dietetic Association uh, annual conferences. And I, again, I, I was talking about something else, and I just discovered this. I'm, I'm like, woo! I'm so excited. So again, parenthetically, the last 30 seconds of the talk, I mentioned this. The first person to grab the microphone says, if even the professionals were fooled by the size and shape of glasses, what hope is there for the rest of us? This is stated like really dramatically too. What hope is there for the rest of us? <laughs> Poor Yorick, I knew him well. <laughs> then she says, the government needs to do something. Now, I don't know what that something would be. But within about two days of finding this out, in our lab, we got rid of almost all of the short white glasses in our lab. And, um, most of us, within about two weeks, got rid of all of our short white glasses at home. <laughs> one, guy even <laughs> one guy even got rid of, you know, you know how red wine glasses tend to be a little more bulbous at the bottom, they tend to be a little whiter at the bottom than white wine glasses? One, one guy and his wife even got rid of all their red wine glasses. Which, you know, the rest of us just thought that was not right, but <laughs> you know, that's, that's what he ended up doing. And so with this thing, I mean, I think in a lot of cases, the keys to reversing mindless eating isn't to be mindful. It's not to say, must not overeat from large bucket. <laughs> it's not to tell yourself, must not overpour in a short, wide glass. I don't think knowledge influences us that much in, in, the, in the heat of the serving and eating moment. The easiest thing to do is if something causes you to pour overeat more than you otherwise would, just reverse that cue. If it's short white glasses get you to pour 30% more alcohol, well, don't have, 30, don't have short white glasses. Big serving bowls cause you to take 50% more, well, don't have big serving bowls. Just break it into two smaller sized bowls and put those in your party. Here's the next myth we're going to talk about. <clears throat> and it gets at something that um, we did in a study called the French Paradox Redux. One of the things we did was we went to 150 Parisians and asked them, how do you know when you're through eating dinner? The number one answer was, I know I'm through eating dinner when I'm no longer hungry. The second answer was, I know I'm through eating dinner when the food no longer tastes good. OK, those are both internal cues, right? You're using your taste buds, your tummy to tell you to stop. 
We did the same thing <coughs> when I hate to pick on Chicago two studies in a row. We did the same thing about two months later to uh, 150 Chicagoans, a match sample of 150 Chicagoans, and asked them, how do you know when you're through eating dinner? What do you think the number one answer was from Chicagoans? I know I'm through eating dinner when, yeah, the plate's empty. The second response was, <laughs> the second response is, I know I'm through eating dinner when everyone else is through eating dinner. <laughs> you know, like they've left the room and turned the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> and the third was, I know I'm through eating dinner when the TV show I'm watching is over. Okay? Now, those are all external cues. That are, we're all looking for something else to tell us it's time to stop. And the problem is, almost all external cues around us, not maliciously, but they all tell us to keep eating. Okay? So if we end up relying on those rather than what's going on in here, we're almost destined for failure. So at the time, we said, hey, well, let's do a study. Let's see if we can figure out what would happen if a bowl never emptied. And so we developed this thing. Um, it's a soup bowl here. I mean, it, we've got a bunch of these tables, but this is a picture of one of them. This, uh, this woman's eating out of a refillable soup bowl. And what we did is we drilled a hole in the bottom of the soup bowl, drilled it through the table, drilled it through that big vat down on the other end, and <coughs> attached some food grade tubing underneath to the bottom of the bowl, underneath the table, and up into the, uh, that big vat. So this poor woman, <coughs> as she eats, the level in the soup bowl will go down, but the second she stops, for even a few seconds, it'll imperceptibly start to rise again. <coughs> Okay? And she can eat for the next seven days, but if she doesn't eat the six quarts of soup that are in that <coughs> fat, she will never see the bottom of that bowl. Okay? <laughs> now, how many people think that if you were eating, on, for, if you were eating 15 minutes out of a refillable <laughs> soup bowl, that, that you'd figure out something was going on? Huh? Yeah, all of us would, of course. Um, <laughs> Of about the 160 people who did the study, only two of them did. Okay, <laughs> one person had dropped like a, a napkin and kind of went and picked it up under the table, and there's all this Borg-like tubing. And, <laughs> <laughs> and there's this, this other guy. And there's this, this other guy who I, I think he's trying to he's trying to channel like a, a Viking ancestor or something. And, and, and believing he's at some medieval banquet, he tried picking the <laughs> soup bowl up. <laughs> and the thing is, you have to remember, though, that this is, this is pressure fed. And he picks it up, and it comes out of the table like a coral snake. It zzz, <laughs> and then pff, spurts all over him. So, yeah, uh, it is, I mean, the, the, guy, the guy across from him stood up and knocked his chair over. And the woman, there's a woman next to him who did one of these, like, you know, like Friday the 13th screams, like, ah! <laughs> so, well, here's, what we weren't so interested in <laughs> was how much people ate, because we figured they'd probably eat more, and, and they did, they ate 73% more. But what we were more, oh, that's what it looks like. What we were more interested in was if it influenced their perception of satiety. And every way we asked them, even though they ate 73% more soup, if you said, um, so are you pretty full? They'd go, no, I mean, how can I be full? I, I still have half a bowl of soup left. And this ends up being a problem, which we end up eating with our eyes more than our stomach. And we've shown this in a bunch of other bizarre studies where we either bust or don't bust chicken wings, and we look at how much people eat afterwards and things like that. So it's, the person who says, you know, I know when to stop is a very rare person. If it's in front of us, we're going to chomp it down. Well, <clears throat> how many people have heard of the Ig Nobel Prize? Anybody? Well, what can you tell me about that? <coughs> yeah, it's for science that... Yeah, it's kind of for weird science. It's for science that makes you laugh and then makes you think. And I'd say about, they give these things at uh, Harvard every year. There's 10 of them doing the same places. And this one, the 
Ig Nobel Prize last year for nutrition. So here's what it is. They have it in this theater. And, but there's a couple of advantages of, of, uh, of this if a person ever wins it. First of all, they have all these real Nobel Prize winners that are hanging around. And this thing, this is like a three-day party. It, it is unbelievable. I mean, I had, I had two dinners with this guy and went to two receptions. So the unexpected benefit is, is first of all, you get to party with real Nobel Prize winners. First benefit. But here's the second advantage of this. It's what your less attentive colleagues think. Here's an email I got the next day. Brian, what did I hear in NPR about a Nobel Prize? <laughs> Only caught part of it. <laughs> yeah, no, that was the part without the egg in front of it. <laughs> so the third, the third myth I want to talk about. <laughs> oh, it's funny. The, the third myth I want to talk about is the myth that most of the obesity problem has to do with food eaten away from home. And granted, about half the meals people eat are eaten away from home particularly the more and more people work. Because if, if you work, you at least have to eat five lunches away from home. So it might have something, it does definitely have something to do with food eaten away from home, but it might also have something to do with the food we eat in our home. And what I was interested in figuring out is how have the calories and the recipes that uh, maybe your uh, mom or dad made for you growing up, how would that have been different four years ago when you were at school? when you're at home, than it would have been maybe, let's say, 40 years ago when they might have been at home. And one way we try to look at this is to say, well, let's look at some standard recipes. Let's see if we can take a recipe book that's been around for like 75 years and see how recipes and calorie content has changed. So we did this. We found the joy of cooking. How many people have seen this in their parents' home? Yeah. So that's the first one right there, 1937. And this, this was right after the war. I think this is at 46. This is 62. And then this is the one that just came out in 2006. So what we ended up doing is we took all the recipes and every one of these additions, and they come, they come out roughly every 9 or 10 years. And what we did is we analyzed the calories and the serving sizes for recipes over the years. OK? Now, but <laughs> that's kind of interesting. <laughs> That's kind of interesting. What's more interesting is some of the recipes that used to be in that are no longer in anymore. And for those of you who don't uh, know some of the finer points of food preparation, let me share one that might have fallen off the map. Some recipes like this one didn't survive the years. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You remember that one time your mom did this, didn't you? So, <laughs> There we are. There's, there's the little squirrel, a little kind of like a little ratatouille there. Kind of. You, hold, you step on the tail. That's a, that's a key point. And then you just, yeah. You might not have seen that in the most, late, the most recent edition. Yeah, that's because you can now buy squirrel uh, in, in, as processed meat. Now, that's what we don't have to. OK. But here's what we found when we looked at calories and stuff. Oh, I know. So we look at salads, main dishes, desserts. The crazy thing is, is that all but one recipe increased from 1937 and subsequent issues up until 2005, six rather. Every single recipe increased in calories per serving except for one. Okay, um, and the average calories per serving, per serving size, increased by 63 percent. Okay, so that kind of means that when you're <coughs> your mom or dad, or maybe when your grandma or grandmother um, was, was eating out of the beef stroganoff recipe in 1937, um, they were eating a whole lot less than you are, um, just looking at the serving size. But about two-thirds of this increase, uh, the, the 63 calorie percent calorie increase, about two-thirds is due to more dense ingredients, like uh, more fat, more sugar, you know, heavier sauces, you know, raisins and nuts and things like that that weren't added back then. And about a third of it's due to just larger serving sizes. Uh, pardon me, the biggest jumps took place right after World War II in the early 60s, that uh, baby boom, boom and plot time, and then um, in 2006. OK. Are you doing OK so far? Yeah. Well, we're going to look at another eating myth, and this is the idea that we know what we like. 
Now, <clears throat> the French have this expression that, you know, there's no accounting for taste. Yeah, I think we can account for a lot more taste than we think. Because our taste buds are tremendously, tremendously su suggestive. Okay? And in fact, we've done a bunch of things with kids where just changing the names of things um, ended up having these tremendous effects on how much kids ate, like calling uh, peas power peas made kids take a whole lot more peas. I mean, the problem with peas is they take them, they don't eat them, they just they power throw them. <laughs> uh, but we did, we did a study one time, too, where we um, were working with a summer camp that the summer camp had this thing as uh, kind of like a, a, it's kind of like a tomato juice. You know? And you know how much uh, um, like seven, eight-year-olds like tomato juice? Yeah, you remember that, yeah. And what we did is we renamed it Rainforest Smoothie. And, they <laughs> and, it's, and for the next week, they couldn't keep it in stock. Okay. Well, let's take a look at this. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll talk about a couple studies. I, I was approached by this guy in the blue shirt right there a number of years ago. And he um, was in charge of 33 cafeterias at a university. He says, here's the deal. He says, we're coming up with this really healthy cafeteria. Everything there is going to be <clears throat> made with low-cal ingredients. It's, it's going to be tremendous. He says, the problem is nobody's coming to it. Okay? Now, um, it's called the Bevere Cafe. And he says, is there anything that we can do to get people to think the food's better than it actually is? Because, <laughs> you know, oh, you know, heaven forbid you could actually change it to make it taste better. You don't want to do that. So one of the things, we did a whole bunch of cool studies, but one of the studies that we did... Is we, <clears throat> we knew that by some other studies that there's this tremendous expectation mindset that occurs when somebody says, hey, this is really, really good. You want to try it? You know, you try it ex looking for something that's really, really good about it. Okay? Or if somebody says, hey, this is my uh, grandmother's favorite chocolate cake recipe. You taste it, expect it to taste good, and your expectations lead to a taste confirmation. And so one of the things we did was <clears throat> we simply, over a course of six weeks, we took a bunch of recipes and we gave them descriptive names, descriptive labels, or we just called them their normal name. <clears throat> so for, for instance, for a two-week time period, we would have a seafood filet out. Then for two weeks, it'd go off the menu, and then two weeks after that, it'd come back, and we'd rename it something descriptive like, you know, succulent Italian seafood filet. That's the exact same recipe, okay? E exact same recipe. It's basically a dried fish stick, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but what ended up happening was that not only were sales much, much higher here, but people's evaluation of the, of the, of the seafood filet was a lot higher. They rated the restaurant as being more trendy and up-to-date, and they rated the, uh, the uh, cook as having had more culinary experience on overseas. Yeah. In reality, the guy had been fired from like Arby's two weeks before. <laughs> but no, no, they didn't. But it didn't matter. We did this all sorts of ridiculous things. So we, we, we called chocolate cake, you know, Belgian Black Forest chocolate cake. Now, it doesn't even matter that the Black Forest isn't in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> People go, oh, yeah, that, that's how I remember it. Yeah, oh, that, that's the stuff. It has this dramatic influence. Uh, and let me give, but you can stretch this pretty far. We have something called a research restaurant. It's called the Spice Box. <clears throat> and um, what we did is we did, decided to do the same thing with wine. As we know in another study that if you, if you put a really fancy label on a bottle of, you know, really terrible $2 wine, people think it's a lot better than this. But we wanted to see if it had a referred impact on the rest of the meal a person eats. So what we ended up doing was <clears throat> we ordered a bunch of these cases of this wine. It's called Charles Shaw wine. And like in California, you can buy it for $2. And what do they call it in California? Two buck shock. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So we took this Charles Shaw wine. We soaked all the labels off, replaced them with labels. that either said it was from Noah's winery, fictional winery, Noah's winery new from California. Or the other half of the bottle said it's from Noah's Winery, new from North Dakota. <laughs> now, we didn't care what they thought about the wine, because our pre-test had shown that they would not like the wine as much. 
But what was interesting is what happened with the rest of the meal. When they came in for this pre-fixed meal, which they paid about 24 bucks for around there, um, not only did they spend longer, if you were drinking the California wine, not only did you spend longer eating, and you ate more of the food, but when people left, they were more likely to make reservations to come back soon. Okay. Love the wine, love the food, want to come back soon. There's people who thought they were instead drinking North Dakota wine, didn't really have such a magical experience. <laughs> <laughs> so what happened with them is they finished up, <clears throat> left a lot of food in their plate, um, and when we said, hey, do you want to make reservations to come back here? They go, oh, you know, uh, I'm just really busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> 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 but they both drank the exact same amount of wine. How much was that? All of it, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's free. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting here. Um, it's kind of interesting is uh, when I was doing this, this one, of the, one, of the, one of the researchers in my lab kept, kept walking around and saying, he said, and he said this like 15 times. And every time he said he'd, he'd laugh, he'd go, hey, some wise guy put a cork in my wine bottle. And um, anybody know where that comes from, the famous person who said that? Initials HS? Homer Simpson. Oh, okay. <laughs> and if we look at it, if we look at how most people buy wine, if, you, if, um, if we look at how most people buy wine if they go over to dinner or some party or something, you know what you usually do? You find a price point you're, you're interested in, and then what do, we, what do most people do? Well, they just look for the prettiest bottle. And according to this, it probably works okay. Now, how many people say that they probably wouldn't be fooled by something as silly as a label or a description of a food? Because yeah, we're all too smart for that. Let's take a look. Smoothie. Unbelievable how suggestible our taste is. Ryan Watson? To demonstrate that, Watson tricked some of our own staff, seven of 2020's college interns. First, he added some chocolate sauce to vanilla yogurt. Then, told the students, we're going to be doing a little strawberry yogurt taste test. Okay. On the table, he had some strawberry yogurt containers. Did you put your blindfolds on? The students put on blindfolds, tasted the yogurt, and then Wansig asked them to compare the strawberry tastes. I think they both taste really strong with strawberry. All the students were certain <laughs> they were eating strawberry yogurt. This one had a much stronger strawberry taste to it. It just tastes more like strawberry. With this woman, Wansig tried something different. We're going to be tasting a couple different kinds of yogurts today. Okay. He didn't tell her what flavor it was, so when he asked her to rate the strawberry taste... Honestly, I didn't know this was strawberry. Okay, good. And yet, by the time I interviewed the group, she too had accepted the idea that she eaten strawberry. When you, like, follow up with a question like, which one is more strawberry? I was like, I had to choose one. They all believed it was strawberry. Actually, none of them were strawberry. <laughs> 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 That would never happen to us, no. Well, the last myth I want to talk about is the myth that I'm going on a diet and I'm going to lose weight. Mm -hmm. We've been doing a few studies related to this. And when I told you that I went through this conversion experience in 1994, and I wanted to try to figure out why do the things we try to do, they, not, they don't really seem to have the effect we wanted. One of the things we ended up doing at that time was <clears throat> I ended up hiring two dietitians and a clinical psychologist. And we started our own little sort of, um, it was not really a weight clinic, but we were just, we met with people who wanted to lose weight. We'd talk to them, we'd give them some ideas. They'd try some things. And then based on how we presented things to them and whether it worked or not, we were able to fashion how we could make messages more effective, but then also what research we could do 
to try to get at some of the issues that they've been, that they've been stumbling with. Now, we did a couple studies, a number of studies related to this, but one of them ends up being there's a couple things that seem to go on when people start uh, going on diets. One is <clears throat> it's usually coupled with, or sometimes coupled with, an increase in physical activity. We've got a really cool paper that we've been working on that looks at this idea of, of compensation. And so the idea that um, you start exercising, you, you go on a diet or you start an ex exercise program, and um, what a lot of people find is they start gaining weight, not losing weight. It's kind of weird. Isn't it? And initially, people got kind of go, it's because I'm building muscle. It's like, yeah, you know, you're, you're walking a quarter of a mile a day. I, I, don't, I don't think you're bulking up too much <laughs> yet, just yet. And we did a really neat study a while back where we, <clears throat> we took people, and this is up at Cornell, and we, we recruited them and either said, what we want you to do, we had three groups. We had a control group where we just gave them lunch. And then we had a group where we said, hey, what we want you to do is we want you to go on a two-mile exercise walk. And then you get your lunch. <coughs> like, oh, God, exercise. Ooh, this, this, this. And so they walked this nice walk on this lake. But it was about two miles. Then we took this other group and we said, you know, what we want you to do is we want you to go, <laughs> we, want, we want you to test out these, uh, this iPod to see how clear the music is uh, on this walk. And so they went on it the exact same to my walk, but they, it wasn't coded in their mind as exercise. It was coded instead just as they're doing something kind of fun. But then they came back and ate too. And the thing is, it seems that when people actually believe they're exercising, they believe that they have put themselves out and they need something in return. And what we found is that compared to the control condition, people who believe they're exercising ended up eating a lot more calories but even they ended up eating about 125 calories more than what they had actually burned off. Now, the other thing that happens is when we go on diets, we say, I'm going to start eating diet food. That's what I'm going to do. And we did a study with um, Subway and McDonald's. We called it the McSubway study. And <clears throat> what we did is we um, intercepted a bunch of people. And there's, a, there's like six studies in here, but it, this is just the, the, the coolest one is the first one. And that we ended up intercepting a, bu a bunch of people when they left um, McDonald's and Subway, and we asked them, how many calories do you think you ate? Now, the typical person in this sample <clears throat> eating at McDonald's ate about 700. Now, they, when asked to estimate how many they ate, they estimated they ate about 610 calories. But this is really highly variable. Some, you know, people, a lot of people don't know what calories are, so it's really highly variable. But we did the same thing at Subway, intercepted people as they left Subway, and the typical person leaving Subway believed that they ate about 325 calories, where in fact they ended up eating about 560, I think. Because what happens? Well, there's a big health halo that surrounds some of these sandwich places, some <clears throat> where they say, well, I, they're advertised as healthy, so therefore that must be low-fat mayonnaise, must be low-fat meatballs in the meatball sub, that must be low-fat salami. Uh, those cookies, I think, that they're, I think they're calorie free even, I think. <laughs> and it's our tremendous wishful thinking that makes us, they still end up eating a lot better, but there's this big difference that was really driven by the perceptions of people believing they're eating a lot healthier than they wanted to, than they, than they were. Well, that gives you a little bit of an idea of some of these myths. Now, in review, let's just take a look at three of these myths. The steel popcorn study, the bottomless bowl study, and the joy of cooking too much. Okay? These cues around us cause us to overserve. We don't know when we're full. And this even happens at home when we're doing this ourselves. Now, these cues around home can lead us to eat more than we might want. And it leads us to say, what would be the solution to this? <clears throat> well, if these were the only things influencing us, we could easily just, if our immediate environment causes us to overeat, what we could do is we could change our immediate environment to eat less. So if big plates cause us to eat, we can use smaller plates. In fact, we find, <clears throat> interestingly, if most of you, probably in your parents' home, have plates that are 12 and a quarter to 12 and a half inches in diameter, what we find is that the smaller the plate, the less you eat, down to about 10 and a quarter inches. Once you go below 10 and a quarter inches, people start getting seconds and thirds, and it kind of cancels out. But down to some point, it works for Basically, everybody we've, we've tested this on. 
big bowls, if that's a problem, use smaller bowls. If wide glasses end up being a problem, use smaller glasses. If eye-level foods end up messing you up, and they do tremendously in your cupboards, well, just adjust the eye-level foods. Put the healthier things right in this range and put your uh, the Captain Crunch, Captain Double Crunch down the bottom. <laughs> if stockpiling and saline sends up messing you up, and it does, rearrange your, your cabinet. Now, if we're such mindless eaters or the mindless solutions, so <clears throat> what we did is we've got a website called mindlesseating.org, and a lot of people have come to this, and a lot of people sort of ask for advice, and what we've set up are some, some ways that people can get free advice based on some personality characteristics. So, you know, if you answer a few questions, we know statistically what's been shown to be most likely to be relevant and to be compliable by you. So we suggest this. But after having done this for a while, we kind of said, hey, wait a minute. Why don't we actually use this for research? Yeah. And so what we ended up doing is we took, we recruited 2,000 volunteers who'd come to this website, not a random sample, um, 41 years old, or they're almost all female, uh, 1.4 years of college, two kids. And what we did is we randomly assigned them to one of 20 changes, <coughs> one of 20 tricks that we or others had found worked in the lab. Okay, I'll, I'll show you what a couple of those are in a second. Um, but they'd be things like, um, yeah, you know, re replace white glasses with thin, use the half plate rule, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, one of them we even threw in was use chopsticks, which is, is kind of a <coughs> ridiculous one, but we, we put that in there too. And then what we did is we randomly allocated 100 people to each one of these changes, with the idea being we would track them for three months. And for three months, we'd see which of these changes resulted in the most, let's say, average weight loss per month. And we also asked some other things too, but that's what we were interested in. And the basic thing we did was we gave people um, a calendar they could print off on their computer that all they had to do is, is if they did their change, let's say, let's say we assign them to the, um, you know, use tall skinny glasses instead of short wide glasses. If at dinner time, just at dinner time, they used a tall skinny glass on Monday, they could put a check. If they did it on Tuesday, they could put a check for Tuesday. If they did it on Wednesday, they could do a check on Wednesday. If they ate out on Thursday, they didn't put a check, so on. Okay. And then we, had, we did a pre-post, self-reported weight, well-being, some biomarkers, health, absenteeism. And, <clears throat> and the, the specific results aren't interesting is what we found after that. And here's kind of what we found, is that these aren't people who are necessarily dieting, and this is the average person. So a whole bunch of people aren't compliant. You know, they kind of, they sign up for it, and then they kind of go out for, uh, to the all-you-can-eat buffet. So this is what goes on. <clears throat> if we look at the, the one that had the biggest impact, it was... It's kind of wasteful. It's leave some food remaining on your plate. And the typical person assigned to that condition end up losing about 2.1 pounds per month. Okay? Not a lot, but that would be about 24 pounds over a year if they kept it up, just by making a passive change. Um, to uh, use a salad plate or a 10-inch plate for your dinner plate, they lost about 2 pounds, and it goes down. But what's crazy is that at least for five of these things, people actually, if they did them, they actually gained weight. Now, that's not what lab studies show, but they actually gained weight in the same way that the person eating at Subway was eating a whole lot more than they believed they were. Now, kind of what was happening here was um, a, a very commonly recommended thing is to eat a hot meal, like eat oatmeal as a hot breakfast alternative. What we found is that if people did that, they actually end up gaining a little bit more weight. But what's sort of confounding here is there's a 0.73 correlation between um, compliance and reported weight loss, meaning it doesn't really matter how seriously you did these things. If you just did it, you're bound to lose weight. Okay? It didn't even matter if you even did it very seriously. If you did it, it seemed to work. And the more mindless or convenient the change is, the higher the compliance was. And monthly weight loss was nonlinear over the three months. And here's what's crazy. The first month, people would lose a little bit of weight. The next month, they'd use, lose a little bit of weight. But for some su sub-segment of the population, the third month, they lost a boatload. Now, this was very puzzling. And we couldn't figure out from the data why this happened. 
But I think the answer came to me when I was giving a talk about a year ago. Does anybody want to guess why there'd be, for some group of people, a very nonlinear ri uh, uh, that why they'd lose a whole lot more their third month and subsequent months than they would their first two? Yeah. Yeah, that is exactly right. It seems that there's this ripple effect that happens. They do this. It works for a couple months. They say, well, I'm not losing 60 pounds a day, but I, you know, things don't feel as tight as they did a couple months ago. Hey, let me try something else. And there's almost an empowerment that happens. And here's what's bizarre. I had this, <clears throat> and I'm going to show a couple of pictures of a couple of people here. And I, this is, they, they said it was OK to do this. But I was giving a talk in, um, in, in Denver just about a year ago. And, and this woman comes up to me. They had a reception afterwards, and this woman comes up to me, and she says, hey, you know, and she's a dietitian. She goes, hey, you know, my, my husband and I, um, <clears throat> we made a change about 11 months ago, and um, uh, we made one small change. As a result, I lost about 35 pounds. My husband lost about 50 pounds. I'm like, wow, okay, what, what, was, what was the change you made? Because that's, that's, that's not unheard of, but that's, that's fairly dramatic. It's about twice what you'd kind of expect. She goes, she says, well, we both came up with this idea <clears throat> of using what we call, um, we, we never sat down for lunch or dinner unless there were both a fruit and a vegetable on the table. And you kind of go, come on, how's that going to do anything? Well, what do you think having a fruit and vegetable on a table caused to happen? What was that? They ate the fruit. Yeah, well, they, they ate the fruit and vegetable, even though that wasn't even a requirement. They ate the fruit and vegetable. Yeah, and they made sure that, the, and, and slowly it sort of evolved, so the other stuff they're putting on the table wasn't quite as terrible as it might have been 11 and a half months ago. And then she also said, too, and she goes, and, uh, and then my husband, you know, after about uh, six months of this, he said, this is going pretty good. So he actually stopped drinking beer and started drinking red wine instead. You can see he's keeping up with that. And uh, this ended up happening. This is a strange ripple effect. Then I had this experience. This is just like two months ago. There's, a, there's these six big um, human nutrition research centers in the country that are funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And the only one of them studies obesity. And it happens to be in North Dakota. Why North Dakota, you might add? Oh, that, 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 right. The center in charge of that appropriations committee is from North Dakota. But anyway, it's in, it's in uh, Grand Forks. And um, the Secretary of Agriculture is from North Dakota. So I flew out there and I gave five talks in two days. And this is what happened in one of the talks. <clears throat> um, at the end of one of these talks, and uh, this, this guy, and the, the, this, the main purpose of this talk was to do this big media recruitment for the state to get involved in these obesity, obesity studies. I finished this talk. It's kind of it's late at night, too. So this might have been maybe 9.30 or something I'd finished. And this guy, the place is almost empty, and this guy walks from the back of the room up. He's got his coat button like this. And he comes up and he goes, I've been waiting all night to show you something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying to myself, oh, Lord, let it be a gun. <laughs> so he opens his coat, and he pulls his sweater, and he goes, he goes, this sweater was skin tight on me just like six or seven months ago. And um, he said he lost 34 pounds in like seven months. And <clears throat> I said, well, really? He says, I only made one change. I said, what change did you make? He goes, goes I'm not kidding. He goes, goes I, st I ate cottage cheese when I got home from work. <laughs> I'm like, what? And then you yacked? I, I mean, I don't know. What, what? <laughs> and he says, he says, no, but because I ate cottage cheese, I wasn't hungry for dinner, so we backed our dinner up from six o'clock when we would have otherwise had it to seven thirty. Because we backed dinner up to seven thirty, I wasn't hungry for a snack at nine like I otherwise would have been. And so I just effectively stopped snacking because I started eating kind of a little bit of cottage cheese when I got home. This big weird ripple effect. Now <clears throat> we can say well, what would be what would be the next steps? If we want to study this ripple effect, if we want to see what happens, well <clears throat> we could try to conduct a big large scale NIH study. 
We could um, try to randomize big groups of populations, see what that would happen. But what if we didn't want to wait? What if we really wanted to try something that we thought wouldn't hurt at all and see what would happen? And so here's something that we're starting. <clears throat> I say we, it's a, it's a, it's a food and brand lab, but it's a whole bunch of other partners we're getting together with. We're starting something called the small plate movement. And the idea here is that <clears throat> the families, if we get them, it's really hard for people to say, don't overserve myself. It's a whole lot easier if you have a smaller queue, you naturally tend to do less. So we're trying to encourage families to use smaller tennis plates. We've got some media partners, the Food Network and the Today Show. We've got a weight loss group that's interesting in partnering. And um, what we're going to do is aim this on a rolling basis, but to launch it initially the 1st of January. And the whole idea is try this just for a month. Just try it for a month and tell us what happens. Now, um, what we are hoping happens ends up being a lot of these ripple-related activities. Because using a small plate, I mean, it looks to me, based on this really rough pilot study, that people are, can lose maybe two pounds a month. But I mean, it's not, it's not going to be shedding off like you're in liposuction. No, no. It's really slow. But it might be these ripple things that happen. And it can be a very passive way for people to get perhaps their kids to eat a little bit less without the kids revolting. But then <clears throat> there's two other big things we've got to look at also. And one ended up being restaurants. Now we've done a study that shows that and if you take an all-you-can-eat restaurant, we did this really cool study about Chinese buffets that just came out. But we, in another study, we showed that if you look at restaurants, the uh, all-you-can-eat restaurants, the typical person will overserve themselves on a large plate, but they'll also end up throwing a lot, high, they'll throw a reasonably high percentage of the food away. And I, I forget the percentage, but it might be 25% of the food they just end up tossing away. They go, they go back for seconds or thirds or ninths or whatever. But with a smaller place, what happens is people not only take less, but they also throw less away. So the restaurant wins in a double way. But even if we look at fixed plate restaurants, like a nice restaurant, if you were to take 10 ounces of, of steak and have it on a 12-inch plate, you know, it looks like an appropriate amount. 12 inches, when we put it on a 10 and a half inch plate, it looks like people are getting an incredible value. It's like, wow, look at the size of that. Well, no, God, it's the exact same size it would be if it were on that plate. It just looks huger because of the plate. So there's these win-win ways to do it. And so I've got some meetings with the NRA and some um, the National, Ra National Restaurant Association and some large chains. And one of the reasons that we're really excited about this is about um, four years, or three years ago, when we came out with the idea about the glass shapes, I called up a bunch of these places like a... Uh, Darden Industries, which is Olive Garden and Red Lobster and um, TJ Fridays, to meet with them and say, hey, you, look, you know, if you just replace these short, wide tumblers that you have in your bars with tall, skinny glasses, your bartender's likely to pour 28 to 32 percent less liquor. You're going to save on that. And you're uh, probably doing a favor for a lot of people who are driving home thinking they had two drinks, but instead they had about two and a half, uh, about 2.6 drinks. And they're like, Hmm. Yes, that would be win-win, wouldn't it? <laughs> and so within about a year, a number of them started, uh, at least one of those chains replaced all their glasses, and another one of them, um, I, I've heard, is doing it on a s more gradual basis. So there's a, there's a case to be made that if you can show a win-win sort of solution, maybe you can get industry to follow like that. We're also doing the same thing with plate manufacturers, and that we figure... I mean, how often do you buy new plates? Yeah, I don't know, like four times in your life. But all of a sudden, <laughs> maybe more of them. But all of a sudden, if, if there's another reason for you to buy plates, and you know, they come out with maybe a, you know, let's say a small plate size or a lean plate size, all of a sudden, that's another reason for you to buy plates. And I think we can get some of the plate manufacturers, Coriel and some of these others, to start producing smaller plates. Now, I'm giving a talk at the, uh, the believe me, you're not going to believe this. There's actually a, a national conference for dinnerware. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. You think partying with the Nobel Prize winners was cool. <laughs> so that's actually in Chicago in March. So I'll be, I'll be going there for four days to do nothing more than to say, smaller, smaller, smaller. <laughs> so that gives you a little bit of idea what's going on. 
And one thing that I want to end with is that, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> if, if you look over the course of maybe um, of, of modern history, and you say, what was it that's contributed most to our quality of life? Well, let's, let's even just say um, to our, 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 our lifespan. If we look in the 19th century, the things that sort of contributed most to people living longer was when physicians learned that they maybe should wash their hands before they do surgery. Yeah, that helped. And when other people found, discovered that maybe having rats as house pets was not really a sound idea. Okay. Now, if you look at that, I think the contributors there end up being hygiene related. So I would call it the century of hygiene if I had to come up with a name for it. In, 2000, in 1900, <clears throat> what would you guess the average lifespan was of the typical person? Is it a number? 40. So somebody want to give me a specific number in the 40s? Yeah, it's 46 or 47, depending on whether you're a man or a woman. What was it in 2,100 years later? 76 and 77, 30 years more. And what happened? Well, I think a bunch of things happened. Maybe <laughs> fewer wars might have helped a little bit. But I, <laughs> but I also think there are a bunch of great discoveries. There are cancer drugs, there's penicillin, there end up being polio vaccines. Um, and if we had to put a finger on what might have contributed most to life expectancy then, I think we could call it the century of medicine. Whereas now, I mean, there's probably some new advances that are going to happen in medicine, but are they going to take us from 76 to 106? No, no. I think it's going to be behavior-related things. It's knowing maybe how to eat a little bit better, or it might be mm, knowing that's probably not a good idea to, you know, like uh, smoke and skydive simultaneously, you know. <laughs> and that I think this ends up being the center of behavior change. And the more we can kind of look at people, and look at their behavior and change that in a good way, I think that's the biggest impact we're going to have. So that is where we're at for today. Thank you very much for the invitation.